Hi folks, Marina Stroud here. I am your product education specialist. Thanks for joining us today and for letting us be a part of your educational journey. Today, we're gonna do something different. I'm pleased to be joined by Justice Clark Lytle, our Chief Research Officer, and the man behind the Tradesmith Decoder Research Service. Hi, Justice. Hello. <laughs> Hello, glad you could make it. <laughs> Me too, slight technical difficulties are all good. Yes, perfect. The unique format today feels appropriate because Tradesmith Decoder is like no other service. Decoder has produced astonishing results for our subscribers. In addition to an impressive run of triple digit percentage gains in stocks, options, and cryptocurrency plays over the last year. The number one stock recommendation in the Tradesmith Decoder portfolio recently produced a documented gain of 2,564% in less than 12 months. Our discussion today is going to be divided into four sections with an opportunity to ask questions at the end. The sections are what makes Tradesmith Decoder unique? some examples of how Decoder works. And Justice is gonna provide us a big picture view of the markets and where things may be headed. At the end, we'll have time to answer your questions. Of course, before we get started, we need to review our usual disclaimer. The information we are presenting today and in upcoming tutorials is intended for educational purposes only. We're not financial advisors and cannot provide any individualized advice or recommendations. We are recording today's presentation, so if you miss something, don't worry about it. You'll be able to go back and rewatch it at your convenience. You can access the Tradesmith Bootcamp webinars under your help menu. I'll show you how to access them and how to sign up for our upcoming webinars. I should also note, we normally go over website features as part of these webinars, but today there's a twist. The Tradesmith Decoder website is in the middle of a significant upgrade and should have new features with a new look very soon. Rather than go over the older site layout today, which will change soon, we'll do another Tradesmith Decoder webinar in a few weeks, which will be our normal format reviewing the site features. Today, you also receive, as part of the handout materials, a Tradesmith Decoder Frequently Asked Questions document and our PowerPoint presentation. So what we're gonna to do today is talk about Decoder's unique advantages as a service and big picture market outlook and share with you a Decoder Frequently Asked Questions PDF document as part of our handout materials. And then in about a week or so, we'll send everyone a follow-up email with material that lays out the new site features with screenshots, along with more details on Justice's background, the decoder methodology and more. So don't worry if you have unanswered questions about the site features today, we'll get you the frequently asked questions PDF today and an in-depth review of the decoder site features not long after. Now, let's jump right in. Justice, what makes Decoder unique as a research service? And how in the world did you find a 2,564% gain on a stock investment? Well, um, hello again, Marina. Um, <laughs> thanks for hosting this yes. and having me on. Um, there are a few things that make Decoder different than any other research service in the publishing financial world, or at least any other service I've seen. And I've been in this world for quite a long time, going on 20 years now. Um, and I'm excited to talk about some of these things because they relate to sort of the philosophy and methodology of Decoder. And they're also the same kind of factors that have produced some of the incredible gains we've seen over the past year including that 2,564% gain. Um, so as you suggested, let's just go ahead and dive right in 
and I'll talk about where these differences come from. Perfect. So one of the things that makes Decoder unique right off the bat is the core methodology of Decoder, the approach that we use, is really about 25 years old. And I say that because Decoder as a service is based on an approach that I've developed over multiple decades. And it goes all the way back to when I first really started getting focused on markets, which was all the way back in 1996. I was actually an English and philosophy major in college, and I had realized that, uh, and my plan was to become a, a liberal arts professor and sort of uh, be one of those cool professors who who, um, <laughs> who writes books in, in the summer and, you know, rides around on a, on a bicycle and flip-flops. And uh, I was inspired by that Robin Williams if you remember that Robin Williams movie, Dead Poet Society, mm -hmm. and, uh, Oh Captain, My Captain, and all that, um, yeah, that was that was kind of my inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. And then I learned from one of my philosophy professors that uh, acad academic life is terrible in many ways, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and I, I I knew I didn't want to be a professor, and I wasn't sure where I was going to go. And and it turned out a friend of mine had a book. Uh, on his dorm room floor called The Investment Biker uh, by this guy named Jim Rogers. And it was all about this retired hedge fund manager who takes a trip around the world on a motorcycle with his girlfriend and decides whether or not to invest in the companies that he, uh, the countries that he passes through on his motorcycle. Wow. And I thought this, I thought this approach was so cool. This guy just traveling around mm -hmm. the world and making money by thinking and deciding whether or not to invest in these countries he traveled through I thought, well, that's what I want to do. Um, and this was the beginning of just a deep and intense study of all the different the legendary investors and traders that I could find uh, to just figure out who, who was doing what in this world of investing and trading and, you know, who were the legends and what could I learn from them? Um, mm -hmm. And that was also, and then I quick, quickly came across a book called Market Wizards, which is one of the greatest trading books of all time just uh, interviewing a bunch of trading legends in one book. Um, and so to shorten up the story, uh, my first job out of college was as an institutional commodity broker, and I started in 1998. Um, and from that point forward, I studied basically every style of trading and investing and also experienced it myself, from uh, futures and commodities to stocks and options to value investing to day trading currencies, the whole works. Um, and I also did an in-depth uh, uh, consultation on the best-selling book, Trend Following, by Michael Covell, a guy who kind of wrote the book on the trend following style and was directly involved with some trend followers who were featured in the Market Wizards books. So wow. basically, um, the origins of Decoder, the style of Decoder, the approach to markets goes all the way back to this big study that I started um, all that time ago. And it's also just a result of, of focusing on the, the biggest and best uh, traders who I could find um, and the biggest and best performance gains of all time from everyone in this group that I looked at. That is super cool, Justice. So you have been around the block and folks, he's still wearing his flip-flops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually bare, barefoot right now, but don't tell anyone. Oh. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so, so there was really, um, a focus here on, on finding the best performers and the biggest gains of all time. And, and, um, and so there, there's a lot of different styles in markets. There's a lot of different ways to make money. Um, there's a lot of different paths up the mountain, if you will, everything from super long-term value investors to short-term day traders and high-frequency traders who hold stuff for a few seconds at a time. And as my style evolved and the style that became the one that Decoder uses evolved, I focused on the money managers who had the absolute best crushing track records from every perspective you can imagine. And when I, what I mean by that is there are a handful of money managers, guys named... Um, named Stanley Druckenmiller and Paul Tudor Jones and George Soros and a couple others. And these guys generated 30% average annual returns or higher on average for decades at a time. So for hmm. example, uh, the 
Quantum Fund was one of the, the original top uh, macro hedge funds. They generated uh, greater than 32% compounded gains more than 30 years. Uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, one of the greatest money managers ever, he averaged more than 30% uh, gains annually with no losing years for 40 years plus. Um, hmm. Paul Tudor Jones, another uh, trading legend, he, he went more than 25 years in his futures trading, again, with no losing years. And these guys were making huge sums of money on top. And if, it, if it, that wasn't impressive enough that they just don't have losing years, they also did this with billions and billions of dollars. And that's where things got really crazy because it, it's one thing to make money in the markets every year. It's another thing to make very large returns and just absolutely crush the stock market over time. And then it's a third thing to do this on literally billions of dollars in assets. Right. And so looking at, looking, at, looking at all the different styles in the market, these guys just stood out above everyone else. And I said to myself, you know, I mean, that's the way to go. How, how do they do what they do? And what I discovered is there were a couple, what you might call secrets that united um, all these money managers, the things that they did the same. And there are really a couple of them that are incorporated into the decoder philosophy. And they're also the things that make the decoder uh, research service different than any other service. And so there are four of them that I want to talk about now that sort of highlight why decoder is different. So, okay. we, can, so we can go to the first one which is what I call go anywhere capability. Um, the ability to go anywhere in the market greatly increases the number of profit opportunities that you have. And what I mean by go anywhere is that the traders who have the style I just described uh, have the ability to trade uh, any liquid asset. They're involved in stocks, they're involved in commodities, they're involved in currencies, they're involved in futures, they can go to any any country, any any international exchange in the world, uh, they can trade in an index. They can buy individual companies. Um, th they can do anything, and so they sort of have this top-down view of the world that lets them trade any asset. And they look at things both from a big picture view, uh, trying to see what's going on from these big sweeping flows of capital. They also look at things from what's happening with individual companies and then they connect the views together to come up with ideas and this is really powerful and explains why these guys tend to make money every year because when you have a canvas that that, that is that wide you're going to have a much easier time finding profit opportunities and so a metaphor that i use is uh, a go anywhere trading and investing style where you can you can be in stocks, commodities, currencies, futures, ETFs, options, uh, basically anything liquid. It's sort of like being a surfer who can mm -hmm. surf the waves on any beach in the world. So if the beach that you're most comfortable with or that's nearby is, is having choppy waves or it's out of season, you can go to another beach. You can, you can go to a beach yeah. in South America or you can go to a beach in Asia or something like that. Um, and in markets, this matters a lot because there are periods where every asset class will sometimes just be go quiet or choppy or, or be void of opportunities for a really long time. So right. there have been periods in the past, for example, where the stock market has just been sort of flat and, and choppy and, and lifeless for long periods. And that can sometimes run for years at a time. And But when that happens, usually there's some other area of the market that's doing extremely well. And you tend to see, you tend to see these markets switch, um, that they have these cycles that go back and forth. So like, for example, uh, currencies were really quiet and really boring for a number of years. Um, over the past decade because central banks around the world had just suppressed volatility so much that the currencies were just sleepy and nothing was happening. But now currencies are starting to explode again and get really interesting. And so mm -hmm. you're seeing this pattern of, of the way sort of shift from beach to beach. 
And that's one of the secrets of these great uh, traders, these amazing records, because they can go to where the profit opportunities are and they can mm-hmm. avoid the conditions that are dangerous or choppy right. or, or don't work well. So, for example, right. if you have um, if you have an investment service uh, or an approach or a money manager who only does, say, small cap stocks, um, and then there's just a period where small cap stocks aren't doing well for a year or two, well, he's going to have to stick with those lousy conditions, and that's not going to be good, and it might be dangerous. Whereas if you can go, well, commodities over here are doing, you know, much more interesting. That that ability to switch just makes mm-hmm. a lot of difference. So, well, just as how do you know which so, uh, beach you need to go to? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a that's a great question, and that's um, no, that's a that's a fantastic question, and that's actually. One, another one of the proprietary skill sets that the coder has is mm-hmm. that we have spent a great many years developing the, the tools and the systems to monitor all these markets. So mm-hmm. part of what you need to do to have a go anywhere style is you have to be familiar with all these different approaches. And right. that's one of the, that's one of the areas where my background came into, um, comes into play because I began my career as an institutional commodity broker, uh, working with commodities and um, farmers and cattle ranchers and currency hedgers and Russian hedge funds. And then after commodities, I traded in an equity partnership for a while and got involved in equities. And so I learned stocks. And then after trading, I got involved in value investing and then growth investing. And so my my own style rotated through all the styles and then mm-hmm. what decoder does on, on a daily basis is we just take in we have a, a, a system for taking in huge amounts of information um from all different kinds of data points from fundamental to technical to uh quantitative and we process just these large volumes of information um, every day and they give us the signals and those signals are sort of like telling us, you know, which waves are are active on what beach. And so and it's a whole involved system. Uh, and that's part of the decoder edge and part of why, you know, a lot of services don't do go anywhere because it's hard. Um, it's yeah. very hard. Um, and that's one of the things we figured out. And then the next one, if we want to jump forward. Sure. The next sort of uh, secret, if you will, is the ability to take big positions. Um, this is very, very important, and it's strangely not really talked about in the investment world, and it's mm-hmm. really not emphasized in the world of research services. Um, some services do this, but very, very few. I can probably count on one hand the number that I know of that do this. Dakota does do this because it's so important. Um, the best traders know how to take big positions and sometimes very, very big positions when the time is right and when the opportunity is extraordinary. Uh, Mm -hmm. In terms of success, um, I have found, and again, there are many, there are many different ways to trade and, you know, the, the decoder way is far from the only way. And there are other methodologies that, you know, that don't do this, but I have found that for the most successful traders and investors in the world, including long-term investors, it's absolutely true that it's not just the, the trade or the position, it's the size of the position that matters. Funny enough, the person who drove this home for me the most was actually Warren Buffett. Um, Warren Buffett is considered sort of the ultimate conservative value investor. Um, many would consider Buffett the most successful value investor of all time. And I wouldn't argue with that. And Mm -hmm. what's funny is that, that in one of his earliest shareholder letters, I I've I've read almost all of Buffett's shareholder letters. I think I've been reading his letter every year, um, at least for the past 10 or 15 years. And I have an, an archive of his old letters. My favorite Warren Buffett shareholder letter ever was his part partner letter for the year 1965. And the reason that's my favorite Buffett letter is because in that letter, he describes 
some of the ways he approaches markets and he explains why he's willing to bet really big when he finds an incredible opportunity. And in his 1965 shareholder letter, Buffett explains why he is willing, if the opportunity is right, to put up to 40% of his capital into a single stock position. I remember when I first read that, I was really surprised because again, you think Buffett, you think value, you think very conservative. But his point was, he said, in the letter, he basically says, listen, if I could have all my bets be small and be the same, exact same size, then that's absolutely what I would do. But the world doesn't work like that. Every once in a while, you get, you know, the equivalent of a fat pitch that's like a grand slam home run, and you have to hit it as hard as you can to really maximize it if you want to do well. And Buffett sort of explained that very well in that, uh, that letter, which is why I still think it's it's the best of all his letters that he's ever done. Um, and that's also an interesting way in which, you know, Warren Buffett, the ultimate value investor, is the same as these legendary traders and macro hedge fund managers, and also the same as many um, ultra wealthy entrepreneurs. The thing that you find in common with these people is that when you find a really great opportunity, a really just, you know, tremendous standout trade or, or position or when all the factors come together, you need to bet larger and you need to use size. And that means you also need to know how to do that. And right. that's, that's a second thing that Decoder does that, again, that most research services just simply do not do. For every recommendation and trade we have, we list the position size. We say, you know, here's the size that we're taking. and it will vary based on our conviction. And so when we've had very strong conviction, as, as you'll, I'll describe in some of the examples we show, we are willing to use very, very large size. And there's a lot of factors that go into that, but that's one of the, the secrets to having just really tremendous returns. The second. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Shall we go, we, we go to secret number three? three? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the third thing that Decoder does that, again, this is very unique and that most services don't focus on it, is the ability to profit in bear markets and not just bull markets. That's really tremendous. great traders, mm-hmm. yeah, re- really great traders and legendary money managers can do very well, not just in bull markets, but in bear markets and even in crashes, too. Um, so... I mentioned a, a guy named Stan Druckenmiller earlier, and he he probably has the single best track record of any money manager of all time. Um, as I say, he he averaged more than 30% compound gains um, for more than 30 years. That doesn't mean he made more than 30% every single year, but if you looked at his total returns over that period, they averaged out to that. And he's also gone 40 years and counting with no losing years. He's had plenty of volatility within his years, but he always found something before the year ended so so that he's never, he's never had a losing year. But one of Druckenmiller's secrets, secrets, which he revealed probably about 10 years ago, I guess, is he said, you know, my, my dark secret is that while I make money in, in bull markets, I'm even better at making money in a crisis. I'm even better at making money in bearish events. And so while he, he, did, he did very well on the long side, he really did well every once in a while when he saw a crisis coming and he saw how to position for it. And that's where his incredible track record really came from. Because if you can profit in bear markets as well as bull markets, that will dramatically improve the shape of your long-term returns. Um, mm mm-hmm. And the reason for that is that the, the average experience for, for most investors, even for good investors who are long only, who don't go short and, and don't do things like that, is when a bear market comes along, they just try to survive or they try to not lose too much. Um, and then every once in a while, there's a, there's a really nasty event like what we saw in March 2020 or what we saw in 2008 or you know, 1994, the crash of 87, and so on. Every once in a while, there's this crash, and it just it's like a needle scratching on the record, and it really messes up their returns for a little while, and then they have to try and make that money back. 
Whereas yeah. if you have the ability to profit in bear markets as well as bull markets, and even to, to generate large profits in a crisis, that really helps your long-term track record because you don't have those big dips that come along every, every five to seven years that you have to claw back from. And so that's another, uh, another advantage that Dakota has is, is we're as comfortable going short as going long and we know how to sort of see the signs when a crisis is coming and potentially profit from it um, as we actually demonstrated last year in the, uh, the March 2020 meltdown. Um, so that's number three right. is, is knowing how to actively profit in bear markets as well as bull. So you're not scared of the bear, Justice. You're like, come on, bear, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I kind of like the bear, I have to admit, just because, uh, well, 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 there's a funny story there is, is, um, uh, there, there, there's a scene in, in the movie Batman Returns where where um, where Bane, the bad guy, says says you know you merely adopted the dark. I was born in it. And um, when I when I started when I started my career as a commodity broker in 1998, um, I came into the tail end of the worst commodity bear market in history. And I had to deal with this incredibly, just the worst bear market in commodities anybody had ever seen uh, at the end of the 1990s. This is when oil was going down towards $10 a barrel and sugar was so cheap, it was almost cheaper than the bag you could put it in, just everything. And then I switched to, to an equity partnership and cut my teeth trading equities um, right before, right as the dot-com bubble uh, was collapsing. And then I was there in, you know, in, in like 2002 when WorldCom was imploding in, in Enron and just all this, you know, all, all this chaos and crisis. So um, bull markets are great and we've done super well in the, in the bull markets that, uh, that uh, you know, we've seen over the past year. But I have to admit, I do like, I do like yeah. the bear side, maybe because I, <laughs> I grew up in it. Yeah. Um, gotcha. And so, so if we go to number four. Okay. Um, the, the fourth secret, and this is, again, a thing that most research services do not know how to do, and again, it's just something that I haven't seen, maybe because it's hard logistically to do, is the ability to change the size of a position in terms of sometimes adding more to a winning position and sometimes uh, taking profits and making the position smaller. And right. I, call, I call this big trend management. Because this is what you, you have to do if you're going to ride a big trend successfully. So let's say that you're involved in, in some, some trade, um, like maybe it's, it's Bitcoin or it's copper or it's, or it's a stock that's just on a multi-year growth path where there's a huge pot of gold a long way off um, and just a lot of profits to be had this big trend that you're on is going to have its ups and downs. There are going to be times when the trend is really strong. There are going to be times when it's pulling back and looking weak and so forth. And so the way to handle that is you have uh, what I call a core position. And then there are certain times where it's like, okay, it really makes sense to add to the position now. So we're going to add more. And then you build your profits by doing that. And then there are other points where it's a, where you say the opposite. You say, okay, um, now it's time to cut back and make our position smaller, but we're still going to maintain a, a core position at a smaller size so that we stay with the trend. We're not going to get out completely because this trend is still up. Um, and this is a really key part of, of uh, again, generating long-term success. And um, this is something that, you know, all those great, great traders that I mentioned that I've studied do well. And it's something that's built into the Dakota methodology in that we actively manage our positions. And so what that means is that if we have a position we really like, um, and again, I'll, we'll show some examples of this, there will be times where we'll say, okay, it's time to add more. It's time to make this position bigger. And then we pile on profits by doing that. And then at other times we say, okay, this is getting overdone or the position starting to, to get weak. You know, we'll cut back. We'll take partial profits, but we won't sell the whole thing. 
and that ability to manage a position around a big trend is it not only smooths things out and adds more profit, it makes it more possible to just ride a trend for a really, really long time uh, or to stay with something for, you know, a year or two years and just really make it to the point of a big gain. Right. So, so those are kind of the four secrets. Um, and if we want to jump ahead, so just to, to recap those, the first one, and again, the, these are these are taken from these are taken from just uh, really kind of a lifetime or half a career's worth of uh, you know study of of the the, the biggest and best traders and, and money managers in the world across all these styles. And the four things that stood out that are built into into Decoder are first the go anywhere capability. Again, we can trade anything, stocks, um, ETFs commodities, currencies, futures, options, cryptocurrencies, you know, if it's liquid, we can be involved in it. We take big positions when the time is right, and we specify our position size on all our trades, and we, and we explain our conviction level. We have detailed information for every, you know, every trade we do. Um, we focus on an ability to profit in bear markets, not just bull markets, and that hasn't been important for the past almost the past year ever since the meltdown, but it'll become really important again, maybe soon. Um, and then the fourth thing is, is the big trend management, being able to add size to positions or take partial profits on positions. And mm -hmm. Decoder does all four of these things actively as a service. And I can honestly say, I don't know of any other research service um, that does all these things. I'm hard pressed right. to think of any that does, you know, one of them mostly, usually they just, they just give you one size or they don't tell you the position size and they don't, you know, this is, this is rare stuff um, yeah. for whatever reason. And, uh, but it, it really gives us, gives us an edge. I mean, I think it's part of the reason why we've done so incredibly well over the past 16 months or so um and why i think we will continue to in, in the crazy markets we're in right now absolutely that's great justice now can you give us some examples of how decoder works the four concepts turned into action maybe with some trade examples yep let's jump into the charts all right this uh this chart shows um uh our the, the biggest winner in our portfolio, um, which is the, the 2,564% cash out that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's also useful because it contains a lot of the principles uh, that, that apply that we just talked about. So we have, the, we have the name redacted on this thing because we're actually still long this position. We still have a very good chunk of it. And there's actually the potential for this, this company um, to grow another 10x to 20x in size. So even though it's already you know, gone up 26x from where we bought it, over, mm -hmm. the next, over the next three to five years, it could go up another 20x just because the opportunity is so extraordinary. And you really, and, and this is also an example of, of the type of, opportunity when you find something like this it's like no you don't you don't buy just a little bit of a company like this when you find an opportunity like this you take a really good sized position and then you add to it um and so that's what we did uh in this in uh i believe it was um in late may 2020 we had our first high conviction purchase of this this company which is it's related to um it, it's a uh, Basically, we call it the, the Goldman Sachs of crypto is my nickname for it. And it's basically <laughs> the equivalent of one of the world's, it's basically the world's first uh, cryptocurrency oriented uh, investment bank. So if you imagine okay. everything Goldman Sachs does on Wall Street, this company mm -hmm. um, does all that stuff in the crypto industry. And so in May of last year, we put out a detailed special report explaining, here's what this company does. And we had a very bullish view on um Bitcoin at the time, which we've held for a couple of years um, and still hold. And we explained all the reasons why this company was going to be very well. And so, you know, we took a very sizable position because of our conviction at, uh, at $1.60, um, $1.60 Canadian, actually. 
Uh, this is so this is also an international stock. Um, and then we just let it run for a while and it produced really nice gains. You can't really see them, the early gains on this chart, because they're compressed because of how huge the gains got later. It just sort of squished the first part of the chart. But right. uh, a couple months, a couple months later, towards the end of October, we were up, you know, I think that I think it was like a double or a triple by then. Again, you can't see it on the chart because so the, the yeah. gains got so crazy <laughs> later. But but towards the end of, of um, September, we said, the news is bullish. The price action is bullish. We're going to more than we're going to double the size of our position or we're um, our original position. And so we added another just really big chunk um, in late September. Um, and we let it ride some more. Um, in November, we had enough we had enough gains and then things were were looking we wanted to lighten up a little bit. So we took partial profits on the added position leg, not the original core, but the added position leg that we added on. So we took some money off the table, we cashed in, and then it really started to move. And then fast forward to late January, 2021, and we issued an urgent crypto buy alert to ev all decoder subscribers. And this was that, that buy alert was not only uh, for this stock, it was also for a couple other, um, uh, crypto stocks we had, um, one of which was, I think was up like 500% by that time. Um, and it was for Bitcoin itself, um, which we also had a big position in. And we said, we sent out this alert saying, we're starting to see, you know, rumbles on, on rumbles in the price action. There's a whole bunch of, of bullish pieces of news converging. If you haven't bought in yet, you need to buy. Um, we're just, we're seeing, it looks like something is going to happen. And then as you can see from the chart, something very big did happen. Um, a mm -hmm. week after we sent out that buy alert, Tesla announced that they had bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin and the whole market mm. just went crazy. That's crazy. amazing. Um, yeah. mm. And, you know, we, we had no idea it was going to be Tesla that just sent everything ripping higher. Yeah. But we saw all these tea leaves and signs. We saw that the price action was good. And there were there were like three or four things converging at once. There was institutional interest was building. Um, you know, there was just there were so many signs that that when when the price action, you know, started flipping a green light, we said, all right, you know, if we've got a huge positions on now already. But if you don't have positions, you need to buy like right now. And then less than a week later, uh, hmm. things just went crazy. Yeah. Um, and and then and then we moved into uh, this year, and of course, crypto just went into a pure white hot frenzy. Um, mm -hmm. And and so then in March we sold the second half of the big add-on position leg that we had, while still holding our core position. And then things went really crazy. And earlier in in uh, this month, actually. Um, we said, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna sell half of our core position, which has grown by 26 times in size at this point, and the, the stock just grew so much that it started overwhelming our portfolio, um, just from <laughs> the sheer growth. Um, and now what a problem we to have. still have, yeah, yeah. It's, that's <laughs> like, what, well, what do I do when I made so much money in one stock, and then also like in bit like this one stock in Bitcoin, like dominate all the rest of our portfolios like uh shaquille o'neal looking down at uh danny devito or something <laughs> um so oh yeah so, so we took half profits um and and we're still managing it and we still have enough size that you know if this thing starts yeah. to rise again because as i say mm -hmm. it could be another 10 20x over the next couple of years because of just the incredible opportunity that it has and so this sort of progression shows you this is what happens when you have conviction to take big size to start. And then there are certain points where you add and there are certain points where you cash out and take profits because things have gotten crazy. Mm -hmm. And our ability to, to sort of dial up and dial back is why we've been able to hold this position, you know, as long as we have and benefit from it. Because if, if you, if you had a methodology where you could only buy once and sell once, you would have either, you know, bitten your fingernails down to the bone or you just would have gotten out you know before yeah. it before it made that crazy run so exactly. um, so this is sort of yeah so this is sort of a good example of 
all the principles um, uh, encapsulate. Right. So let me ask you, Justice. Uh, Tradesmith Decoder gave instructions for each of these points, telling subscribers what to do every step of the way? Yes, that is that is exactly how it okay. works. So we send out uh, commentary every trading day. Every trading day we send commentary. Um, once a week we send a um, uh, portfolio update that has detailed market commentary. And when a trade goes out, we have specific instructions. So we'll say, here's the trade, here's the price action and the, and the chart behind the trade, here are the specific reasons we like it, here's why our conviction is high, um, here's what we're doing, we're buying you know, or selling X, Y, Z, here's the risk point, and most importantly, here is the position size. So mm -hmm. we basically try to give as much of a window in your thinking as possible along with specific instructions to make it as close as we can to sitting next to, you know, a seasoned trader as they explain the moves that they're doing movement by movement. And, yeah. um, you know, being able to communicate every day is one of the ways that we do that. That's great. How about an example of profiting in the uh, bear market environments? Oh yeah, that, that's a that's a fun one. Um, although this was not a fun time, this is a chart from the from the the melt the March meltdown of last year, and um, in the you know the the 2020 pandemic meltdown, and back then we were you know we we pay attention to everything, and we take in you know we take in more uh, information on any given trading day than the average investor does in a month and maybe two months. Um, mm -hmm. And over the course of an average month, we probably take in more information than the average investor does in two or three years. Um, and this is only possible because we have this really finely tuned process. And as a result of, we, of that, we have like all these detectors for, for you know, little things that are going on that can potentially become big things. And obviously the pandemic was one of those tiny little things that became a very big thing and wound up changing mm -hmm. the world. And so we were starting to get very concerned about the pandemic back when people were still sort of brushing it off. And we started buying puts, uh, put options, which profit when the market falls as a hedge against the pandemic hitting markets. And we mm -hmm. actually wound up buying puts on a, a couple different uh, stocks and um, various names that we thought would would get hit by the pandemic or were vulnerable. And uh, this is one example, United Airlines, um, we bought put options on, on United Airlines on February 21st. And that was literally, I, th I believe that was a Friday. And the Monday after that, like literally the, the, the weekend passed and everything started to tank. So Jeez. we bought these United Airlines puts right as everything was going off a cliff. Um, a mm -hmm. week later, we took partial profits. Once again, that ability to take, uh, you know, to exit partially for 146%. Um, and then a couple weeks after that, we took profits again at 468%, and then again at 572%. And so this was just kind of an extreme example of having antenna out for, okay, this looks like a, a serious situation could be brewing. And, um, you know, and names like this and Caterpillar, and I think Uber was another one we did really well in. Um, this is an example of how you can generate profits in, in a crisis or a crash, which can really help bolster your portfolio at a time when other investors are, you know, are panicking or, or losing capital. And then that gives you a, a real advantage too after the crash is over, because then you have profit cushion to go out and buy the stuff that are bargains. Or on sale and the ability to do this to you know to profit in situations like this you just have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on you have to be aware of building risks and then little signs um, you know danger signs in the market and then you have to know how to be able to structure the position so like in this particular case we bought puts um, in other cases we might uh, short an ETF or something like that um, right. 
But yeah, so this this was an example of protecting our capital and actually profiting in a, in a scary situation. Yeah, exactly. How about an example of a go anywhere play, something unique? Yep, let's uh, let's look at a commodity. Um, okay. We can go to this is a chart of the iShares Silver Trust. Um, in this particular instance, we use the the ETF rather than the futures contract. And this was something we did immediately after the March 2020 crash. So if you see that arrow on the left there, um, mm -hmm. it was, I believe it was two or three trading days after everything had melted down. Um, and we had a pretty good understanding of what happened because, you know, we, we had um, play by play experience in 2008 and we realized, okay, there was just a huge fire sale where where the whole world got a margin call and all these money managers were just forced to dump their positions. And then you had the federal reserve come out and they just said, you know, they basically said, we're pumping a, a trillion dollars in the markets and we're doing QE infinity and, and we're going to buy, you know, they just, the fed went insane. They did, yeah. they did more. The federal reserve did more within like 72 hours um, of, of the crash than than the whole 2008 rescue of like, you know, a full year after that, they just basically blew that out of the water. And so we said, all right, we're going to take a really big position in silver. And we described it in the trading alert. We said, we're going to be buying silver on sale as the Fed goes to infinity. And the rationale was precious metals and silver in particular are going to have to do really well here because the central bank is going crazy. Um, so we took a big silver position, um, and that did that did really well. Uh, we were up uh, we were up more than fifty percent um, fairly quickly on that position, and then in July um, we saw silver had been consolidating for a while. It sort of consolidated all through the month of June, and then in July it started to break out again. And conditions were very bullish at that time. So in July, we said, you know what? We're going to add more. So we have this great position and it's doing really well. And now silver consolidated for a couple of weeks all through the month of June. It's now it's breaking out. So we're going to buy even more. And so we just added another big chunk onto the position in July. And of course, you know, that didn't too, too bad as silver proceeded to, to kind of go crazy. And so that was, you know, an example of taking advantage of a, of a panic situation from the other side and then adding to the position and really benefiting from that. And then uh, silver backed off a bit uh, and it had a sharp reversal in September and we were monitoring it to see, you know, so what's going on here? Is silver going to go to $50 an ounce um, or is it, is, is the move kind of over? And there was just a whole lot of uncertainty during that time, if you remember, that right. was heading into the 2020 election, and, and uh, there was just a tremendous amount of uncertainty around a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And the outlook actually started to to weaken for precious metals, and so we cashed out for half profits of our silver position in November, um, and then silver tried to break out again sharply in January, but then it immediately gave back the gains, and we said, okay, um, now it's time to get out. Uh, out, yeah. So we closed, we closed out our whole position. But again, this demonstrates the advantage of, you know, there are certain points where you add more and then there are certain points where, you know, you take some profits and then sometimes you go all the way out. Yeah. And a lot of it's, a lot of it is just res watching what's happening and responding to changing probabilities as you know, new events and situations develop. So for example, if silver had broken out higher instead of lower in September, or if the news had been inflationary or something like that, we might have even bought more. We might have bought a third time, or we would have mm -hmm. just, you know, or we might have just let the position run, you know, rather than cashing out. And so this is, is part of, of maximizing profits as well. It's not about, it's never about, oh, I'm going to pick the perfect time to like sell at the top or, you know, or, or whatever. It's more, you're always using odds and probabilities to make smart decisions about, you know, 
when you add or, or when you cash out and so on. Yeah, that makes sense. So is it safe to say, Justice, that this is only a small sample of the decoder gains over the past year or so? Yes, that is correct. I could give you 10 more examples like these um, easily. Uh, as you mentioned, a whole lot of triple digit stuff. Um, some additional crazy ones like, you know, 500% gains or more. We, we are coming off one of the craziest bull market manias of our lifetime. Um, I mean, what we're coming through was, was just incredible. But yeah, we did see we did see a whole lot of opportunity over the past year um, in a number of different areas, and there's a lot of examples we could walk through. And I think it's really just it goes to show the benefit of, of the go anywhere style. Um, and when you have a wide range of opportunities, uh, you you just find a lot of great trades. And so we were pretty active um, yeah. over the past year. That's amazing. Now, how about we check out the market outlook? What are you seeing in big picture terms for the year ahead and a few years out? Sure. So that's a, that's a really um, that's a really big topic, and uh, it's something that we visit in, in small chunks every week uh, in, the, in the model portfolio update. But I can give you the overview here with a handful of charts. Um, so we can start by talking about interest rates and debt levels. Okay, okay. so these are the, these are government data charts from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. The chart on the left shows the, ten, the interest rate on the 10-year Treasury note going all the way back to the early 1980s. And as you can see from the chart, the interest rates peaked in around 1981, um, and they have been falling ever since. They've basically yeah. been falling for 40 years straight, just down and down and down. And inflation has also been falling for 40 years straight. So it hasn't been deflation, but inflation has just been getting less and less for, for the, over this four-decade cycle, really big trend. Um, and at the same time, debt levels have been rising ever since 1980. And so if you look at the chart on the right side, that shows the, um, the debt-to-GDP ratio. For the United States. It's, it's the amount of debt that we have compared to basically the income of the entire country every year. And right wow. now, um, the level of debt that the United States has, the, the gross federal debt um, as a percent of gross domestic product, is the highest that it's been since World War II. We mm -hmm. haven't been up here since the 1940s. And if you think about it, it makes sense because in World War II, we, we accumulated a lot of debt so that we could, you know, have um, send bombers and, and tankers and soldiers over to Europe and help win World War II. And the, the pandemic this time around was sort of like a, a, a world war, but against a virus uh, instead of, uh, you know, instead of countries. And so our debt levels have just exploded. And these two charts are related because they... They picture something called the long-term debt cycle. And what happens in the long-term debt cycle is you have a really long period of time where interest rates are going down and leverage and debt levels are going up because as interest rates go down, it gets easier and easier to borrow, right? And, yeah. um, but we've sort of reached the end of the line. We've gotten to the point where interest rates have gotten so low They've literally gotten as the lowest they've been in recorded history, going back like 5,000 years. Um, and they can't really go any lower. And at the same time, our debt levels are close to reaching maximum. We don't know where the max is, but we're starting to get to the point where our debt can't really go much higher than it is now. And it's not just the U.S., it's the whole world. It's, 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 there's something mm -hmm. like $230 trillion worth of debt in the world. And it's sort of at the maximum amount that it can be. And what happens is when you reach this far, the pendulum starts to swing the other way. And that is what we're on the cusp of seeing. That's what we're seeing happen right now. And so if you go to the next, uh, the next two set of charts, okay. the chart on the left shows the producer price index for uh, a representative commodity, commodity uh, lumber and wood products. And um, lumber is just in just in a historic shortage right now. 
And so the price of lumber is skyrocketing because of the housing boom that's going on. But, uh, and funny enough, there's plenty of trees around, but the reason lumber is, the price is skyrocketing is there's not enough sawmills. And so you, you get lumber out of sawmills, you have to process the trees, and, and there's just not enough capacity um, for mm. all the demand that's out there. And so for the lumber that's available, um, the price is just going through the roof. It's, it's something like quadrupled over the past year. And this is representative of what's starting to happen to a whole lot of commodities and a whole lot of stuff in supply chains, because um, a lot of supply chains were broken because of the pandemic. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of consumer demand because trillions of dollars have just been pumped into the economy. Um, the average American consumer has the highest personal savings rate uh, basically ever right now, the personal saving rate is the highest it's been since records began in like 1959. So people have a lot of money in their pockets. They want to buy stuff. There isn't enough stuff and there are shortages and you're seeing it everywhere. The price of the price of used cars is going through the roof. The price of this oh, yeah. and that. There are things you, you know, if you want to buy a bicycle, you have to wait like two months. There's just, there's a, the, there's the biggest backlog in, in like 70 years for a lot of manufactured goods and delivery times. And so what's going to happen is this is going to create inflation for the first time in 40 years because the government pumped trillions into the system. They put all these money in people's pockets. People want to spend that money. There's not enough goods and services available because of shortages. Prices are going to have to go up. At the same time, there's a big job shortage right now. You're hearing stories of, of uh, uh, there, there's a French, a, a McDonald's franchise owner in, in Florida who's paying $50 just for people to show up to an interview. He's so desperate to, oh to find people to work at McDonald's. You're yeah. hearing about like Applebee's. You're hearing about Applebee's and TGI Fridays that are giving out a $200 signing bonus just to, you know, just to take yeah. a night shift job there. And this is happening all over the place. And at the same time, Again, because people have so much money in their pockets and unemployment benefits have tripled, a lot of people are saying, you know what? I'm not going to go back and take that, that lousy mm -hmm. job I had before unless no. they pay me more. So yeah. that means wages are going to go up. And so, again, we're going to see real inflation for the first time yeah. in 40 years. And the whole, the whole government mentality has changed. The mentality now is, Let's pump money into the economy and, and pump it in the lower half of the economy to make things grow, and that's going to create inflation. And so mm -hmm. this chart on a, the, that we see on the right side, this chart is actually an in, it's, it's just the, the chart I showed the slide before, but it's flipped. So it's that chart showing interest rates falling for 40 years. This is the same chart like flipped. Just to give you an idea, this is what happens when that goes into reverse is we are going to be heading into a period of rising rates and rising wow. inflation pressures, and it could last for a really long time. And this matters for markets because it's starting to impact things right now. We just had the biggest um, March uh, consumer price index number in nine years. And every earnings call now, companies are talking about our supply chains are broken. We can't get this. We can't get that. There's shortages all over the place. There's companies that are going to be forced to raise prices. The reopening is, is creating this big gap between uh, current wages and the wages people are asking for. So all this is happening right now. And unfortunately for markets, this is turning into a bearish event for the stock market right now. And we're pretty bearish overall in stocks right now. Um, and if you go to the next slide, okay. I'll explain where that comes from. So part of the danger for the stock market right now is that this big vaccine powered recovery and this reflationary boom, a lot of it has already been priced in. So the economy is going to grow like crazy right now. The U.S. economy is actually probably going to grow faster than China's this year, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. That's, yeah, um, it is. But, but a lot of this is already priced in. People have been so enthusiastic for so long that, you know, the S&P was up something like, uh, like 80% from the March lows. So it can only go so far. And at the same time, 
a lot of the really speculative areas of the market have already started to pop and they're already going into bear markets. And this is what you see when a market sort of rolls over. So we're entering this big, giant kind of buy the rumor, sell the news type thing where we've already sort of priced in the enthusiasm around the recovery. And now the potential pain of higher interest rates, long end interest rates is coming as the 10 year yield rises and the potential pain of tax hikes, tax uh, rises are coming as um, the Biden administration plans to raise corporate taxes to pay for the multi-trillion infrastructure that's coming. Um, and what happens when a market rolls over, when a market switches from bullish to bearish, is that it doesn't happen all, all at once. You usually see pockets of weakness in the most speculative kind of crazy areas first, and one area will fall, and then another area of the market will fall, and they'll gradually weaken, and then finally the stuff that's the most like safe, you know, place to hide type stuff will, will start to decline last. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of seeing that already now. So if you look at this chart on the left, this is a chart of the, the Defiance SPAC ETF, which is like a the bellwether um, exchange traded fund for uh, special acquisition companies or SPACs. And mm -hmm. this big crazy SPAC bubble has already popped. This thing is already down something like 24% and it already popped in February. So, so SPACs are already deep in a bear market. Another super hypey, super bubbly area of the market is electric vehicle stocks. They were sort of the center of the craziness for a while with Tesla, the leader of all those stocks, and the electric vehicle um, bubble has also already popped. If you look at uh, electric vehicle names, almost all of them now are deep in the red bear markets, and some of them are just in bloodbath status. I mean, we're talking, you know, down 30, 40, 50%. And so the S&P and the NASDAQ are still making new highs, but this is the process where it goes from one to the next to the next. Um, and the chart we see on the right side is uh, the Russell 2000 index, which represents small cap stocks. And this one hasn't started to roll over yet like SPACs or electric vehicles, but it's really starting to weaken. You can sort of see this head and shoulders top formation that, that's forming slowly here. Um, yeah. And in the past month, in the past month, large caps have outperformed uh, small caps by more than 10 percent. So we, we just recently saw um, S&P, the S&P 500 go up 6 percent in the same time period where small caps actually went down 4 percent. So our basic view is that the economy is on a growth path right now because so much money has been pumped into it. And inflation pressures, inflation pressures are coming back fast, really fast because of supply chain gaps and because of wage gaps and just this huge demand and all this money in people's pockets they're ready to spend. And that means interest rates are going to go up at the long end. The 10-year yield is going to start to rise. And that's going to start hurting weak areas in the market. And that could be the thing that just really causes us to see to see sort of a bearish trend in the market for the first time in a while, partly because everything just got so overbought. I mean, people just got so excited. So we're we're really kind of transitioning to our bearish hat right now. Um, we still mm -hmm. have some bullish positions, particularly in like you know Bitcoin and crypto, uh, some selected equities there. But we've really taken a lot of profits off the table we sort of we, we we really kind of piled up a lot of cash relative to where we were just because we're concerned about things rolling over right. right now and we're really starting to look at uh look at at short positions in various things and wow. that's, that's where we're at right now yeah. mm -hmm. um and then yeah. a, a little bit a little what's that oh i was just gonna say that sounds a little bit scary <laughs> Well, it is, it is, but yeah. it's also, it's also part of the normal cycle, right? So, yeah. so markets have always moved in cycles and they always will. And, you know, we, we've kind of just came, we had a 10 year bull market 
from 2009. And then we had a, we had a miniature pandemic. We had the pandemic meltdown. And then we had this huge, you know, just trillions in stimulus. I think more than $12 trillion worth of stimulus over the past 13 months, if you add the monetary and the fiscal together. And then we had one of the fastest, just most raging bull markets ever. And so now it's just a part of the cycle where, you know, what goes up must come down. And that's just yeah. part of yeah. that's just part of the nature of things. So yeah. um but there's gonna be opportunities on the on the bear side and there'll be opportunities in, you know, every market yeah. environment, just like there always are. That's great. Well it sounds like decoder is prepared. Now um we do. We are running a little bit uh, behind. Um, how about we get to some questions? Sure. As I mentioned earlier, we would normally uh, go over the website features as part of this broadcast, but Tradesmith Decoder is in the middle of a website overhaul, and we're adding some new features. So uh, what we'll do in, uh, is email you a PDF for those of you that attend and, and a follow-up email with screenshots and feature of the features for the new decoder site layout. The PDF will also include uh, some frequently asked questions and a more in-depth look at Justice's background and the decoder methodology. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox in the next week or so. So let's go ahead and take some questions. And the first question I, um, I received here, Justice, is, are you still bullish on Bitcoin? And the answer there is yes, although it really depends on time frames. Um, time frames are are always important. Um, really, the, the question of whether you're whether being bullish or bearish has to be a matter of time frame um, because the answer can be different. So. We we took a very large uh, Bitcoin position shortly after the March lows, and um, we added to it at various points, um, and then we also took profits on it at various points, sort of the same as some of the other examples we showed. And so we still have Bitcoin, and we'll continue to hold it long term, but we are concerned about just sort of the the overdone nature of crypto right now. And also, if you look at Bitcoin's performance. Um, Bitcoin is up something like 400% in less than six months, and it did that. It, it did, did that without even touching its 50-day moving average once over that time. And so that is just like you know, for an asset to go up 5x in half a year and not even look down. I mean, that's that's a world champion performance. But it's also the kind of thing where you can reasonably expect. A pullback after that, or or a counter trend, or maybe even a downtrend that lasts for uh, a few months before it consolidates and then starts to go up again. So, longer term, we are we are uh, very bullish, remain very bullish on Bitcoin and the digital gold thesis and the potential for for Bitcoin to uh, go up much further from here. Actually, Bitcoin has another you know 10x potential over the next few years but in the short term we're very wary of just the extreme enthusiasm mm -hmm. in the crypto space that that's really gotten overdone and may have sort of hit a crescendo with the uh the recent coinbase direct gotcha. listing, which was just sort of a, a frenzy in, in dogecoin and some other crazy stuff so yeah. long term yes we are very bullish on bitcoin short term um we've cut back our exposure and we're cautious. Okay. So what do you think of uh, Bitcoin versus gold? Uh, Bitcoin is, well, Bitcoin is, it sort of speaks for itself to the degree that uh, Bitcoin's outperformance has, has crushed gold over the past year. We still see opportunity in gold. I think the opportunity in Bitcoin is going to be much stronger than it will be in gold, at least for the next couple of years. And the reason for that is because Bitcoin is on a one-time journey to becoming globally accepted as a store of value alternative to gold. And so what that means is there's a very reasonable chance that the price of gold could double in the next five years 
But if that happens, the price of Bitcoin will probably go up 10x um, because Bitcoin is just has a much more exciting adoption path right now. And Bitcoin's also being integrated into all these payment rails and systems. And you have PayPal and Venmo and actually yeah. Visa is, is and MasterCard are getting involved now. And mm-hmm. so it's just um, it's becoming much more globally adopted. And it's coming from a much smaller market cap. So uh, gold has the potential to do well in the next few years. But if it does, I think Bitcoin will do, uh, will do much better because Bitcoin's market cap is still rising relative to gold. So if gold's market cap is around 11 trillion, I believe, and Bitcoin's is closer to 1 trillion, Mm-hmm. Bitcoin, I think, will eventually get to where it's, it's equal to the market cap of gold. And so okay. that is that is going to be a really big move on that side. Okay. Thank you. The next few questions I have uh, pertain to the decoder. So how often yep. does decoder trade? So it's it's really organic in the sense that mm-hmm. we don't believe in having a set schedule, but instead we scan actively for opportunities. So that means there can be windows of time where we trade a lot and we're very active. And then there can be other windows where we're quiet. And um, the general feeling is just that, you know, performance is served best if you calibrate to what the best performance is rather than the artificial schedule. Um, with that said, we are pretty active. Um, we it's, it's not uncommon for us to have an activity level where we have uh, 15 or 20 different positions in the portfolio. And sometimes we'll buy baskets of stocks. So for example, one area we did really well in uh, was energy stocks. And we, we bought energy stocks in December and, and bought uh, uh, sometimes we'll buy six or eight stocks at a time. So we're, we're pretty active as, as a service goes. We're more active than a normal, than most typical research services. But again, but again, it's not a set schedule and yeah. it's not short, short-term short trading or, or day trading. Like we're usually looking for things that we can hold for months at a time uh, if the trade goes well. Okay. Now, does Decoder trade international stocks as well? Yes. Uh, yes, we do. We've, we've had a number of positions on the, the, the Toronto exchange and I believe we've done some things here and there with um, with the Australian exchange. Uh, we plan to get more exposure to international stocks in the future. Um, so we've done a little bit and we come across international names. We're mostly North American right now, but we, we do have the ability to trade international stocks and we're planning to expand our coverage there because we actually want to, it's just more opportunity. Um, and that's going to be a function of expanding the research team. So once we have more analysts working on, on the Dakota portfolio uh, under my direction, and that's something I'm working on, we'll have the ability to do more in, uh, in Australia and Europe and so forth. So oh, we, do a little bit, we do a little bit now, and we're going to do more of that in the future. That's wonderful. A few more questions here. Uh, one um, member asked, why did you stop writing the Tradesmith Daily? That was uh, well. Tradesmith Daily was something I, I really enjoyed writing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a lot of fun. We got a lot of great feedback. But I realized that there is just too much to do in terms of exciting expansion possibilities on the decoder side. So, for example, um, expanding more coverage into international stocks is one area, and expanding more coverage into cryptocurrency is another area area we really want to do with Decoder. So Decoder was originally a cryptocurrency service a few years ago um, when, when in its original form before it became evolved into a go anywhere type service. And then we sort of cut back on our cryptocurrency co- coverage a bit. So we were doing Bitcoin or doing crypto related stocks, but not really getting super deep in the crypto universe. But now there's so much going on with decentralized finance and, and just other interesting things there. We really want to expand there. And so it's really just about the opportunity set, looking at what we could do by adding more to cryptocurrencies and what we could do adding more to international stocks, um, adding more different features, 
it just looked like time to cut something back to have more time to expand the feature set of the coder and expand the research team even more. And so Tradesmith Daily had to be um, put to the side because of that. Gotcha. I've got one more question here before we go. Um, is the 60-40 portfolio still a good idea? No, it is not. And I know that's I know that's a really scary statement for a lot of people because the 60-40 portfolio is so popular, but it's really kind of becoming dangerous now. And for people who don't know what the 60-40 portfolio is, it's a standard portfolio uh, configuration that has been really popular for decades. And the basic idea is put 60% into equities and 40% into uh, safe treasury bonds or vice versa if you want to be more conservative. So the idea is to have a big weighting of your portfolio in stocks and a big weighting of your portfolio in bonds because the bonds are supposed to be safer and the value of the bonds will rise when in, in turbulent market periods. Mm -hmm. The problem with the 60-40 portfolio is the whole concept of the 60-40 portfolio is designed for periods of falling interest rates and falling inflation. So mm -hmm. when interest rates are falling and then inflation is falling, at least in the government statistics, the way that it's been for the past four decades, having a big chunk of your assets in bonds is good. Bonds are a safe haven asset. But when interest rates start to rise and inflation starts to rise, bonds are just a way to lose money. And yeah. so there's going to come a certain point where the 60-40 portfolio, the bond part, is, is just going to be all pain and no gain because inflation makes bonds worth less. And rising rates at the long end of the curve makes bonds worth less. And the government has so much debt that they're going to have no choice but to try and deliberately inflate it away. And what happens then is that you lose real purchasing power on your bonds. So the 60-40 portfolio, I think, is going to go out of fashion painfully as more and more people realize this and inflation starts to take hold. Uh, people are going to have to be more active in in managing their risk when we switch right. over to this other universe where um, interest rates are rising and inflation is rising too. Good, interesting point there. Well, I think that is about all the time that we have left, Justice. Folks, thank you so much for uh, joining us and thank you, Justice, for letting us uh, pick your brain. <laughs> oh, it was fun. <laughs> Absolutely. <I love> this <laughs> hopefully we can we do this everybody. periodically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, there's a, there's there's always going to be plenty to talk about and thank you yeah. for everybody who's uh hung out and sent in great questions. Yeah, absolutely. So remember folks, in addition to the decoder FAQ PDF, we'll follow up with you via email with uh, another PDF that gives you more details on how Decoder works, the new site features, Justice's background and methodology, and more. You can also email Justice directly here at decoder at tradesmith.com. And if you are interested in learning more about becoming a Decoder member, please give our plan specialists a call. Let them know that you attended today's Tradesmith Decoder uh, bootcamp. All right, folks, uh, before we go, let me just go ahead and show you where you can sign up for our upcoming boot camps. So let me just get to the website here. All right, folks, so to sign up for our upcoming boot camps next week, you'll click on the green help menu. You'll scroll down. You have beginner lesson and intermediate. Next Tuesday, if you click on beginner lesson, you can click on that very first link, boot camp webinar sign up. We're going to touch upon the risk rebalancer tool. So if you'd like to join us next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, please feel free to register. And on next Thursday, we'll scroll back down to the intermediate lessons. You can click here at the top of the list. And we're going to talk about, oops, I've got to update this. So the next uh, Thursday uh, boot camp will be on 
Ideas by Tradesmith Assess the Market. So we'll jump into the site to review that. Alrighty, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, thanks, Justice, for, for talking with us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you again. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you, folks. You take care, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.